Um, about a month ago, Lacey asked me to teach. And um, she said once she organized her thoughts on the book, she would let me know what she wanted me to teach. And when she told me the chapter was on the discipline of time, I laughed. Um, and actually, Chris laughed too. And um, I'm pretty sure the Lord is laughing. Um, Chris said that this would be like how the Lord used the Old Testament prophets like they would use, or uh, God would use their life as an example of either what not to do or what to do, but in my case, um, maybe what not to do. Um, so the Lord has been working on this particular thing with me for a long time, so I do find it rather funny that this is the exact chapter that, um, that he ordained for me to teach. So uh, time management, the discipline of time, is perhaps one of my biggest struggles. Um, it is not necessarily that I, like, lay around all the time. I feel like I'm always busy, um, but I historically do not manage my time well. Um, in college, I did many an all-nighter, not because I was just so diligent in studying. It was because I would put it off to the last minute, and I would have to stay up all night. Or um, when people come over, like, C group or come over for dinner, most likely, if anybody were to arrive five minutes early, I would still be in like sweatpants, maybe not with my teeth brushed, and I would be shoving things in closets. Like, I am historically a bad manager of time. Yesterday, we had family pictures, and um, at 2.30, we had to leave to go to the location. And at 2.30, Chris and the kids were in the car, I did not have my outfit on. Um, I was still curling my hair. And um, at 2.37, I finally run out to the car with my makeup bag and my nail polish so that I could do those in the car. Like, I am a historically bad manager of time. Um, I don't triage well. I get lost in the, like, oh, this would be fun instead of doing what I need to do. And honestly, I think, like all of us, I do what I truly want to do, not necessarily the things I need to do or the hard things. Um, it's something I'm getting better at, but it is a lifelong struggle for me. So with our time today, um, I'm not speaking as one who has this down pat, actually quite the opposite. So if you struggle with time management, I'm here to say, me too. Let's figure this out together. Let's wade through what this looks like and see where God is leading us. Um, so today, our focus is on the discipline of time. If you have the book, this is chapter 10. It's a really good chapter. It's a quick chapter, um, but I found it to be full, chocked full of wisdom that is just really, um, really, really great. So we are talking about the discipline of time, or maybe a better term for it is stewarding our time. Um, Steward means to look after something, be responsible for it, manage it. Um, the Holman Bible Dictionary says, says it this way. Stewardship is utilizing and managing all resources that God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. I love that definition. So let's talk about that further. I'm sure all of us struggle in some way with time management. It may not be the struggle for you like it is for me, and that is okay. We all have different struggles, but I'm sure in some way we each have this struggle of stewarding our time well. So for a couple minutes, I want you guys to kind of break up into small groups, however you're feel, you feel comfortable, and just kind of talk about what is your particular struggle or what keeps you from stewarding your time well um, or from managing what God has given you. So you can have a couple minutes, and then we will come back and discuss. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of similarities and overlaps, but I want to hear what did you guys share? What are some things that um, you discussed that keep you from stewarding your time well? Laziness? Okay, yeah. Just like let's get it over with. It's, there could be laziness, okay? Okay. What else? Yes, like overestimating. Yes. Yeah, this one is a big one for me. I'll be like getting ready in the morning and they'll be like, let me just go start a load of laundry. I need to you know, or or whatever. And then 
I'm late because I didn't, yeah, I overestimated what I could do. Okay, what else? Yeah, okay, not wanting to, yeah. Um, yes. Um, not wanting to. Um, you know, the, actually, Elizabeth Elliot talks about in another book of just do the next thing, do the hard things first. Um, for me, I'm like, no, I don't want to do the hard thing at all, so I'm going to put it off. You know, like, I don't want to do it, so I'm going to do everything else but that. Um, yes, so not wanting to. That's a good one. What else? Yes. Man, that teacher on the next wall is super loud. <laughs> Should text him to quieten it down over there. Yes. 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 For sure. Yeah. Man. Anything else? I feel like this encompasses a lot. Also, by the way, that's Chris teaching, if you didn't know. <laughs> it's not Matt. I would never say that about Matt. That is Chris. Um, yeah, I think, honestly, so much of what keeps us from stewarding our time, like, there might be legitimate interruptions, and that is, that happens, especially if you've ever had kids. There are legitimate in interruptions. Um, or I say that just because I have kids and that's where my legitimate interruptions are. But a lot of these other things are internal, right? So it can come from external, but the majority, I think, of our time management is a me thing and not necessarily, um, you know, something coming at us. So most likely, many of these are struggles or things that we've all um, dealt with, they're all common to us, um, and we all want and need to steward our time well. I don't know that I've ever met anyone who was like, I've got this down, you know. Um, we might recognize it in somebody, um, but I don't know that anybody would actually say, oh, I am just killing it on the time management. I've got it down. So for a lot of reasons, we don't manage our time. So the goal for today is to think through how we can all do this better, how we can think about time in a different way. So there's a couple things that I want us to consider, and one of those is the nature of time. Um, I have been studying through the book of Genesis with the high school discipleship groups. And so when I was thinking through, okay, what is the nature of time? That song from um, A Sound of Music, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Um, that's what came in my mind. Let's start at the very beginning, the very beginning words even that God has given us in Genesis. So where does time come from? In Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created. God is the creator of all things. When I think of creation, like the creation story, I typically think of like trees and whales and um, stars and bugs and lions. But the Lord also created concepts and structures that organize our life. Have you ever tried to define time? I was sitting, uh, when I was prepping this lesson, I kind of was going through the, like the who, what, when, where, why. So where did time come from? Time came from God. What is time? And then I thought, man, it's one of those things that if you try to define it, you know what it is, but it's hard to put into words. So I went to the dictionary. And let me just read to you what some of these definitions are. Number one. Time is the continued sequence of existence and events that occur in an apparently irreversible succession from the past through the present into the future. I was like, what? I know all those words, but what does that mean? Or the indefinite continued progress of existence and events. I was like, they're complicating this. This is too hard. And so finally, there was one that says, a point of time as measured in hours and minutes, like midnight or noon. I looked at these definitions, and I thought, man, it's so hard to capture what this is. Um, but we see time is described as an ongoing existence, a history of people. The Greek word for this is kairos. There's two Greek words that talk about um, 
about time, kairos, which means the appointed time for something um, that is purposed by God. Um, and it often refers to an, an opportune time or a moment or a season, such as like the harvest time or a wedding season. Um, but we also have chronos, which is where we get the word like chronic or even synchronized chronology. So chronos is the chronological or sequential time, such as minutes and hours and days and weeks. While chronos is quantitative, it can be measured, kairos has a qualitative, permanent nature which describes characteristics. So we'll flesh this out a little bit more. So at the appointed time, we hear that throughout Scripture, at the appointed time, the kairos, God acted and he created the world. One of the first things he created was light and dark. He separated them and called one day and one night, and there was evening and morning on the first day. And then the next day of creation he created, and there was evening and morning on the second day, and so on. Our finite minds cannot even wrap our head around a time without the measure of time, that chronos. We have never existed out of time or in a structure that does not have time, both the kairos or the chronos. We are bound into a particular history. We all live right now in Kentucky in 2021 during these particular life events with these people. These are our markers of time. Um, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3 that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There are, of course, the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. But there's also seasons of childhood or times when we were in school or perhaps motherhood. But there's also seasons of sickness and difficulty and so on. There is a consistent measure of our days and seasons that punctuate our life. COVID is one of those. We're all going to say, oh, that was before COVID. Or that was during the shutdown. You know, we are, COVID is going to be one of those that when we look back and even now, we're going to mark things before, during, or after. We all have these different seasons within our own life. And yet, in Jude 25, it says, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Before all time, the Lord was. We have no category to process what was before creation. Only that, in the beginning, God, the Word, was there. Time is not eternal, but God is. Time is a created function. If God created it, time is his to give and direct as he pleases. So understanding that God, um, that God or that time is created, and specifically that God is the one who created it, helps us to understand its purpose. We should not be slaves to our schedule or to life events or to what happened in the past or what's coming up in the future. Time is a gift given to each of us to be stewarded, to be used well, to be managed, to be taken care of, or to be used wisely and appropriately. <clears throat> and we're all given the same measure of time. We're all given 24 hours a day. But we are not guaranteed a certain measure of days. Um, we cannot make time pass quicker or slower. Um, there was, I think it was when I was pregnant with Henry. He was born in July. I went, Chris and I went to the Southern Baptist Convention that June. I was very large, eight months pregnant, flying to Arizona. And I remember that was the most miserable plane ride I had ever had. Like, I couldn't get up and walk around. I was hot. I was just so, <laughs> like, frustrated. And it felt like every time I looked at my watch, it was just like another minute instead of like 30 minutes or an hour. Like there was nothing I could do to make that time pass quicker. Even though it might feel like it's passing quicker sometimes or not, it just felt like it drudged on. But we can't do anything to affect time change. Elizabeth Elliot says we can only receive time and be faithful stewards of it. Each one of us has different demands on our time. So if you are a stay-at-home mom like I am, um, my time demands are going to look different than if you are um, a teacher 
or the CEO of a hospital or, or a big corporation or work at a bank or so on. Um, and with these different demands, we have to rely on the Father for guidance and direction. Me time does not exist in the kingdom in that no time actually belongs to us. Um, Matthew 25, 14 through 30 is the parable of the talents. The master is going on a journey, and before he leads, he, co- he calls his servants in, and um, he gives each of them a, a certain number of talents, which is a quantity of money. So when the master returned, each servant was held accountable for what he did with that quantity of money. Um, they were held accountable for how they used the money, and the money was never theirs. Um, they were simply acting on behalf of the master according to his interests and his character. And this is what we are doing with our time. Our discipline of time is not so much to be like super productive or to get all the things done, which those things are helpful, but that's not the goal. But rather, our goal should be to steward this gift of time that we have been given according to the master's interests and his character. So if the Lord created time and created me as well and all things, then the reasonable and the logical understanding is that he is in charge of all time. He is sovereign. Um, it is his to, time is his to do with what he pleases and commands. Um, Psalm 31, 15 says, My times are in your hands. Um, the author of this psalm is David, and probably most of us know the history of David's life. We think this psalm was written toward the end of David's life um, because he talks of things like how God has led him, guided him, protected him. He speaks of his enemies and about the results of sin. Um, David's life was not easy. There were sweet moments of rejoicing, but there were a lot of times of grief and sorrow and violence and death. He was pursued by Saul and on the run for, like, for his life for almost a decade. And yet in this psalm, he acknowledges that none of it was happenstance. It was all ordained and in the control of a sovereign God. My times are in your hands. Um, I found the Lord is so good. Yesterday, um, a friend passed on some books to us. Uh, Chris and I are like book hoarders. Um, we love books. I kind of feel like if I have the book, it's just going to like magically like get into my brain, even though it's been sitting on like my bedside table for two years or whatever. Like um, I, we love books. And somebody passed on some books to us. And one of those books was a collection of Charles Spurgeon sermons on Psalms. And I already knew I was using this particular psalm, so I looked up what Charles had to say about this, and this is what he said in a sermon regarding Psalm 3115. My times, that is to say my ups and my downs, my health and my sickness, my poverty and my wealth, all those are in the hand of the Lord who arranges and appoints according to his holy will the length of my days. And the darkness of my nights. Storms and calms vary the seasons at the divine appointment. Whether times are reviving or depressing remains with him who is Lord both of time and eternity. And we are glad it is so. Whether, whether it is to come out of our life, excuse me, whatever is to come out of our life, it is our heavenly Father's hand. Not only are we ourselves in the hand of the Lord, but all that surrounds us is. Our times make up a kind of atmosphere and existence, and all this is under divine arrangement. We dwell within the palm of God's hand. We are absolutely at his disposal, and all our circumstances are arranged by him in all their details. And we are comforted to have it so. The fact that my times are in his hands is a comforting thought. Um, So often when we look around at what's happening in the world and we think, what is going on? Like the fact 
why is there a charter bus driving through our parking lot right now? Like, who's coming? Um, no, we look around. We read the news. We know of people getting sick. We hear of all these tragic things happening, and we're thinking, what is happening? And the fact that someone is in control is so comforting, and the fact that that someone is perfectly good and perfectly holy and perfectly just, this is a really, really comforting thought. When I read this, uh, this sermon expert, uh, excerpt, I thought of the song that we sing. Um, I'm not going to sing it because <clears throat> that's not helpful. But um, the song that we sing, Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me, this is the truth that we sing when it says, um, To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. And it talks about how the night is dark, but that the Lord has led us through the darkness. Um, when it says, um, through the deepest valley you will lead. It is the Lord. We, uh, I think, sometimes think about the happy things that the Lord gives, but the Lord also gives us those challenging times to grow us, to strengthen us, to purify us. Um, when uh, Charles Spurgeon says that the darkness of my nights and the storms and the calms, the good and the bad, the Lord has orchestrated all of those times for us, for his glory. Um. Later in the same passage of Psalm 31 in verse 19, it says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. God not only controls all time, but his abundant, perfect goodness is at work through all of it. We know this truth from that famous passage in Romans 8:28. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. He is working all things, all times for good, for a purpose. But it's his time, his purpose, his goodness. Now the opposite of this, so if we were instead, instead of seeing that all time is not just happenstance, but if we were to think of it as just this meaningless string of events, this chain of reaction, this is going to lead to boredom at best with life, but cynicism at worst. Um, Elizabeth Elliot writes that for the Christian, time is transfigured as we see it held in the love of God, created by and for Jesus Christ. We see the past as God's continuous action in man's history, giving him freedom to act. And the future as belonging also to him, holding for us that hope of redemption. And we are given the present with which we are to choose whom we will serve, knowing that this moment affects the next and we are accountable for all of it. So we see this interplay of the um, kairos and the chronos, the continuous action of God in the past and the hope of redemption in the future, those seasons, those events, those kairos, but the chronos, the right now moment by moment matters. Um, we see this interplay of God's sovereignty and our freedom to act when time. Um, and it's confusing and so often you think, how does this work together? In his book, um, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, J.I. Packer says this. Again, Charles Spurgeon <laughs> was once asked if he can reconcile these two truths, man's choice and God's sovereignty to each other. And he said, I wouldn't try. I never reconcile friends. Friends, God's sovereignty and man's choice, that in our minds and in our hearts seem to be working against each other. They are friends. This is the point that we have to grasp. In the Bible, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies. They are not uneasy neighbors. They are not in an endless state of a cold war with each other. They are friends and they work together. So God's sovereignty is working together with our free choice and time is in all of that together. And I can't lay out, hey, this is where God's sovereignty ends and man's choice begins. We don't know what that looks like. We just have to trust that God is good and he is holding it all together. Um, God is sovereign, but we are responsible for how we steward our time. This is why we need to be con um, intentional with the time God has given us. 
Psalm 90, written by Moses. So often, this is like such a side point, but so often we think of the Psalms written by David. And when I came across this Psalm, I was like, this was written by Moses. And I don't know why that was so exciting for me, but it was. So Psalm 90, this written by Moses, says in verse 9 through 12, For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So, teach us to number our days. Um, in the New Testament, um, Paul says it like this in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of our time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God has commanded us how to live, how to use our time wisely. The sum of our life on earth is to glorify God. How we do that will play out differently for each of us. We have like we said, uh, I said earlier, we have different demands on our time. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. We are put into different um, arenas. Um, the circle around us looks different. So the way we glorify God might look different for each of us. But our obedience to this call is necessary. Um, before the Lord was crucified, um, he prayed this high priestly p prayer in the garden right before he was arrested. And in John 17, 4, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He accomplished the work that God gave him to do. This is astonishing and amazing. Um, I am a, a, a list maker. I love it. Um, it's like... Um, my favorite thing to do, I'll make lists, and then if I do other things that are not on the list, I go back and write them on there so I can cross them off. Um, because I'm like, I did that, so I have to cross it off. Um, I had COVID um, about a month ago, and I'm quarantined in my bedroom by myself, and I'm still making lists. Like, I was like, what am I going to do today? Okay. Like, I love to make lists, um, and each week, I normally will make a list on Sunday of the things I need to do for the week. or And then each day I have a list, like, no joke. I have just scribbles of paper with lists all over them. But there are days that I can't even mark one thing off. Like, I'll look at my to-do list and I'll think, um, well, I thought about this and then didn't get to any of the other things. Um, I am, can confidently say I have never completed my to-do list for a day um, but yet the Lord accomplished, he finished all the things that the Lord had for him to do while he was on earth. He healed all the people that he was supposed to. He went all the places he was supposed to. He said all the words he was supposed to. Nothing was left undone when he was here on this earth. And he perfectly completed everything that was set before him. Um, that is hard to even consider because my broken self cannot even fathom that being my reality. Um, think about all the demands he had on his time, all the things that other people wanted him to do that were not for him to do. Um, we even see in some places the disciples coming to him frustrated because they wanted him to be here or there or to help this person. Um, consider all the things that were left undone. When he left this earth, the earth was not made perfect. Everybody wasn't healed. Um, yet, at the end of his her earthly life, he, di he told the Father that he finished all the work that the Father gave him to do. This doesn't mean that he did all the things he could have done or meet everybody's expectations, but he did exactly what God the Father gave him to do. And he did it perfectly without sin. Um. I get hung up on all the things that are possible for me to do. Or, um, well, they are expecting me to do this or this. Um, the Lord did none of that. He did exactly the precise thing that the Father wanted him. God has also appointed each of us with a to-do list of sorts. But 
are we listening? Are we in tune with the Spirit um, and to the Father to hear His commands for us? Are we submitting our to-do list for His review? Um, Not only this, but is our obedience to God even a priority on our time? Do our days revolve around His will for our life or our own? Um, When I think of baptism... We, you'll hear the pastors say, when they take someone below the water, we are buried with Christ in baptism and we're raised to walk in a newness of life. Does our life, the way we prioritize our day and our time, look different because of Christ? Does it look different than before we were a believer? Um, when we are buried I always have this like a uh, mental picture of when we were buried I stay down in the water but it's Christ that comes up and he's just using my body um, does our time look different um, Elizabeth Elliot says there is always enough time to do the will of God and for that we can never say I don't have time when we find ourselves frantic and frustrated harried Frustrated, harried and harassed and hassled, it is a sign that we are running on our own schedule, not on God's schedule. God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. And that um, frantic feeling is us, not the Lord um, giving us too much to do that we can't get done. We must learn to say no, even to good things and even to things we want to do. Are your weeks so scheduled that being in the Word and gathering together with the local body of believers, does it take a back seat or push back to later or next week? Um, It is not wrong for our children to be a part of extras. Um, We as parents love to give good gifts to our kids and things like sports and um, dance class and clubs and all these other activities flow out of those good gifts that we give to our kids. But is our life dictated by tournaments or a coach's practice schedule? Is this a faithful stewardship of our time as well as our family? Or maybe it's travel. Maybe you're always on the go and never grounded in the word because you're moving from one thing to the next. Is work and getting that next promotion or accolade your driving force? All of these things are not bad in and of themselves. They can all be really good and useful tools, but they cannot be your priority. Um, Does everything, and even the Lord, does it come second in your life? We have to evaluate ourselves on this, and it's not just something we have to evaluate one time. This is a continual process. Where in my day am I putting other things before um, communing with the Lord to living out the Lord's purpose for my life? Um. When Chris was working on his master's at Southern Seminary, um, a professor told him that some of you, in order to get an A, you are going to sin against your family and your church or uh, your other commitments. So you need to get a C and move on. But for some of you, if you don't get an A, that will be a sin because you have misused what has been given to you. Um, Chris and I, I think, we moved to seminary when we'd only been married a year. And I remember hearing this and being like, <laughs> like it, it blew my mind a little bit. But um, he and I frequently go back to this point. What am I holding on to as sacred that the Lord is wanting me to put down? What am I idolizing that the Lord wants me to, um, to give up for the moment? What am I neglecting that the Lord has specifically given to me? As a mom with young kids, this is so convicting. Um, Am I neglecting doing something for my kids, stewarding something, uh, my relationship uh, with my kids because I'm tired, which I am. (laughs) I'm always tired. Or because I want to do my thing. But we all have this. That's just how it applies specifically to me. Where am I easily distracted rather than being steadfast? Um, Or what is annoying um, with those interruptions that the Lord has specifically placed in front of me? Um, Or maybe for you, it's not necessarily this sort of time management, but maybe it's um, leisure and um, comfort. Maybe that's your issue with wasting time. 
So often I have personally found that my downtime is actually a purposeful distraction of not to do something. Um, kind of like what we talked about here. Um, it's keeping me from doing something or dealing with something I don't want to do. Um, like I don't want to deal with even like something going on inside my own heart. So I turn on Netflix and I'm just like, I'm just going to watch this for a moment. I don't want to deal with this. But Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm 23, it talks about the rest that God gives. God gives us rest, um, but am I resting in him or in something else? Um, we have to bring everything under the um, control and purview of the Lord and his, um, and his word. Um, Elizabeth Elliot reminds us that God's timing is perfect, but in the moment, we tend to panic and want to be read in on the situation. When something is going bad and we just say, what is happening? What is this for? It's hard for us to trust in those moments. Um, and even though we might know that our times are in his hands, sometimes it feels like they are in other people's hands. Um, doctors or our boss or something else. Um, in the book, Elizabeth talks about flying over Canada and seeing the patterns on the fields that um, were made by farmers plowing their fields. And if you've ever flown, you probably can imagine what this looks like. You see, um, it's like a patchwork quilt. You see colors and shapes and of the different landscapes. And um, she remarked that though the most um, that the most beautiful designs grew out of the interruptions a tree here, a pond there, a hill, a rock, a river. The plowman had to bend the line each time he passed one. Um, and like I said earlier, um, as a mom of young kids, I feel like I understand this interruption part. Um, I like to have a plan. I like itineraries. I like, like before Chris and I go anywhere, I'm like, hey, what's the game plan? What are we doing here? I like to have like an understanding of what's coming. Um, but children don't always flow with that. They uh, tend to do a lot of what they want. And the other day, Henry and I were headed to Lexington early in the morning. And I thought, okay, this is great. I'm going to listen to this podcast that I've been wanting to listen to. And um, it was about, uh, it was a podcast called Risen Motherhood. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn something today. It's going to be so good. And like every 30 seconds, I was pausing that thing. And I was getting so annoyed. Um, I wanted to listen to this podcast, and Henry wanted to talk about sharks. And I know nothing about sharks. And most of the time, he's like, why does the shark do this? And I'm like, I don't know, buddy. Um, let's look that up, you know, when we get home, because I don't know, and I'm driving, and I can't look it up right now. And it honestly really annoyed me. Um, I just thought, I just want to listen to this podcast. Will you let me listen to this? But in that moment, I was also reminded that he is my most important task. He's four years old. I'm his mother. And it was in my annoyance that the Lord reminded me that God does not begrudgingly care for me. He is um, not annoyed with me when I come to him. He is not, you know, shaking his hands and um, hurriedly answering my questions to get past it. Um, Man, that was so convicting of how the Lord is such a perfect father. And in that moment, I was not. Um, interruptions can bring about something beautiful. Um, interruptions happen. We, they're interruptions because we don't know they're coming. Sometimes this is sickness, a job loss. Um, it could be happy interruptions. Um, a child or a move or, or something. Um, they're not always bad interruptions. And the Lord was not surprised by these interruptions. In Matthew, it says that a, ball, uh, a bird doesn't even fall from the sky without him knowing. So my son annoying me in the back seat is not a surprise to him. He is not surprised by these interruptions. He knows every aspect of our time. And so often what we think are interruptions are actually reminders or wake-up calls pointing us to something better. I want us to pray that the Lord would use these unexpected things to create something beautiful in our life. Um, moving on, there's another um, a thing that Elizabeth talks about, and that is the danger of worry when we are um, um, uh, stewarding our time. She says, there is time to do anything and everything that God wants us to do. Obedience fits smoothly in his given framework, but one thing that most certainly never fits is worry. 
Um, and I want to caveat this, um, that this worry that uh, she talks about and that I'm going to talk about is the intentional fretting. Um, this is not the mental and emotional anxiety that comes from depression or mental illness or physiological changes. That's another topic for another day. I don't want you to hear me say that if you're struggling with that kind of weighty anxiety and depression, that that worry is sinful. Um, that's, again, another topic. I'm talking about the intentional dwelling on something and not trusting the Lord with it. We all know what that looks like when we just keep coming back to an issue. We what if, and we kind of let it grow bigger and bigger. That's the kind of worry that we're talking about. And Elizabeth Elliot gives us six reasons in her book um, of why worry is not time wisely spent. Number one, she says, worry is totally fruitless. Um, Matthew 6, 27 says, can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? We cannot. Worry never produces what we want it to. It never changes the situation. Uh, situation. It accomplishes nothing. It's fruitless. Number two, worry is worse than fruitlessness. It is disobedience. How many times um, does scripture um, tell us, do not worry, do not be anxious? Um, by intentionally fretting, we are not trusting God, which is to say we are disobeying God. Number three, worry is taking what has not been given to us. For example, tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is not ours to worry about. We can plan and we can try to be prepared, but we are called not on not to worry. Um, each day has its own troubles. Uh, when I think about the Lord's Prayer, he asks for the daily bread. He does not ask for bread for tomorrow or next week or what if this happens? Are you going to give me bread that day? He gives us day, um, the Lord asks for his daily bread. Um, and number four, re worry is refusing what is given. Today's cares, not tomorrow's, is the responsibility given to us. That's what's apportioned to us in the wisdom of God. So often we neglect the thing assigned for the moment because we are preoccupied with something that is not our business just now. So this is the what if question that I feel like specifically women, we all play through in our head. Um, the, okay, what if this happens? What am I going to do? There is something to say of stewarding our time and resources well and being prepared. But so often those what if questions just lead us to worry and fret, um, fretting and that time goes by quickly and we have accomplished nothing. God's grace is for realities, not possibilities, not those what ifs. God has given us what we need for this moment. Um, and when whatever comes, he will give us grace for that as well. Number five. Worry is the antith antithesis of trust. These two are mutually exclusive. It's kind of like light and dark. They cannot coexist together. Um, you cannot both trust God and worry about the future or what's going to happen or um, resources or whatnot. They cannot happen at the same time. And number six, worry is the wicked squandering of time and energy. Um, when I read that word wicked, I thought, I don't think I'm wicked. <laughs> like, that seems a little strong. But um, worry, this intentional fretting is disobedience. And that is a wicked and evil, evil heart to not trust the Lord. Worry is a wicked squandering, wasting of time and energy. Time and energy are both finite. Once time is gone, we can't get it back. And the same is true for energy. Um, if we spend both of those um, resources that we have, time and energy, if we spend both of those worrying, um, how can we honor God with those times? What? Okay. Um, what can we do? Or excuse me, if we spend time in worry, we cannot spend time how God wants us to. We are wasting time doing something that is fruitless and disobedience rather than productive for his kingdom and for his glory. So how do we know how to use our time? We know that time is given by God. It's created. He gives all of it to, or he gives it to us. It's, um, it's a gift and that we should steward it wisely. And we know we are not supposed to worry. So how do we know how to use our time? 
and for this we must be wise. We need the wisdom from above that James mentions in James 3, 17. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And how do we get this? Through God's word. There's no other way to get this but, then, but through God's word. Um, Proverbs is full of things about being, not being a sluggard or lazy. Um, but in the first couple of chapters, Proverbs, Excuse me, Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 4, 7. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. We get this pure wisdom that James mentions through God's word, through spending time with him. And we see this from Jesus' example. He often would get away on his own to pray and commune with the Father. Um, when Paul was in prison, um, I love those um, in the letters of the New Testament, the very end where he like gives little notes like, hug so-and-so for me or, um, you know, stop fighting, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but my favorite one is when he's like, bring me the parchments. Um, bring him the scriptures. He's in prison. When it says, bring me the parchments, he wants the scriptures brought to him. And we are told to feed on the word. Paul wanted to feed on the word. Um, when we think about our own bodies, how often do we feed our bodies? How often does our bodies need nourishment? How much more so does our soul need this regular intake? Um, so again, Elizabeth Elliot gives five encouragements on how to do this in, her, um, in this chapter of how to have a daily time with the Lord. So number one, let it be a regular time. Um, for me, this has to happen in the morning. Um, my day derails very, very quickly and things overtake me. And so I have to start in the word or it's not going to happen. If I keep pushing it off and off, there's always going to be something else that's demanding my time. Good things, but um, there's always going to be something else. So often when I'm laying in bed, I will <laughs> almost like chant to myself, word before world. Word before world. That's like my mantra in the morning when I want to get distracted and do that load of laundry or just sit and stare. Um, word before world. I need the lens of the gospel to filter everything else from my day. Elizabeth Elliot says it similarly. She says, commune with God before you commune with the world. Your attitude toward the world will then arise out of your life in him. Um, when you plan to do something at the same time every day, soon it becomes a habit. Soon it becomes expected. Um, and you're more likely to stick with it. And if this is not something that has traditionally been um, easy for you or something that you've incorporated into your life, I would encourage you to start small. Maybe start with just 10 minutes and then move from there. Grow it from there. Um, but we have to be in the Word. There is um, no other way for us to know the Lord than through His Word. Um, another, uh, number two, have a special place. This is also very important to me. Um, I have this comfy chair in, my, in the corner of my bedroom that I like to go sit in with my coffee in the morning. And it's a place where I, have, I don't have a ton of distractions or I, I don't feel those distractions. I have distractions. Um, I just ignore the pile of laundry that um, is in the other corner. But um, it's a place where I can not be distracted and I can be alone. And another benefit is that's where all my materials are. When I use my Bible, I leave it right there. Um, I also have like a little cup of um, pens and highlighters and post-it notes, and I have some Bible commentaries there. I have my journals. I keep everything right there, and it is my place. That's my go-to spot. Um, I don't know about you, but if I get up from that spot to go find a pen, it's done. Um, I'm over, and um, so I like to have everything right there. Again, the consistency of time and place is key. Um, number three about how to have this daily time with the Lord is to pray. Keep a list or a journal, um, whatever method works for you. Pray scripture, worship through prayer, confess sin, offer thanksgiving, thanksgiving, petition God. We need to be not only um, intaking, but also talking back to him. Um, sometimes there are um, 
like not formulas, but um, maybe like a format that is really helpful if uh, praying is not something that you are comfortable with or comes uh, easily to you just yet. Um, the acronym ACTS is a good way to think about pray. A, ad, um, adore. C, confess. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication. Um, if you need to order your prayers, that's a good one to use. Um, there's a lot of different acronyms or um, rubrics, that sort of thing that can be helpful, but um, we need to be praying and talking with the Lord every day. Number four, she says to keep a spiritual journal, um, noting things that you've learned, prayers answered, or scriptures for memorization. For me, praying and the scripture journal kind of go together, um, but um, that is so helpful to be able to look back and see what God has done, what God has taught you, where you've come, um, where he's brought you from. And number five, read a portion of the Bible in some ordered sequence. I think this is a huge key. You don't have to come to the Bible and just like open it and say, read something and say, what does this mean? If you don't have a plan, you're going to fail. There are many plans available for the benefit of reading chunks of Scripture. Um, and you want to read big chunks of Scripture together because this is how you learn the context and the overarching theme so that you can understand what God's Word says. This is vital for biblical literacy. Um, and I also want to say that devotionals are really good aids. Um, but don't swap a devotional for time in the Word. Um, don't sacrifice the true source. Um, don't feast on the snack when you have a full banquet in front of you of God's word. Again, they are helpful tools and they are good, but um, it's not a substitute for being in the word. So this list is just helpful tools, and uh, my encouragement is whatever it takes to be in the word, to make it your priority for the day, do it. Change your schedule, change your sleep patterns, your routines. Um, I've mentioned this uh, before, you may have heard it, but um, a couple years ago, I think it was after I had Henry again. It feels like everything happened after Henry. But um, after I had Henry, I was like, how do I get all the things done in a day? How do I make this happen? And I went to an older lady, um, or older than me lady here at church, and said, how do you do this? How do you have kids and also read the Bible? How do you make your life um, uh, revolve around Scripture? And she just pointedly told, like, she asked me what my schedule looked like, and she was like, you need to wake up earlier. And for me, I really love sleep. Um, and getting up earlier was not something I really wanted to do, like, ever. Um, but she encouraged me, change what needs to happen or change what needs to be changed. My sleep patterns needed to change. I needed to get up before my kids in order to make this a priority. Um, my routine needed to change. I needed to go to bed earlier so I could wake up uh, earlier. Um, one day I was conv uh, convicted of how much time I spent um, getting ready in the morning, particularly when I worked outside the home. I would get up and make sure my clothes are ready for the day, shower, make up hair. I would gather all my things, my purse, you know, my lunch, my coffee, all those things. But I was not necessarily preparing my heart to face the world. I was not communing. I was taking so much time in this preparation that I was not pre preparing myself. Um, scripture talks about giving a tithe to the Lord, those first fruits. Are we giving our first fruits of ourself to the Lord? The first fruits of our day, of our energy, um, of our mental capacity. If it's in the afternoon, my brain's done by then. I have to give my first fruits of my best thinking time to the Lord um, so that I can love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I have to give the first fruits, not just of whatever resources I have, but of myself to that time in the Lord. So, the work of how this works out. So maybe, like me, there are areas that you need to work on, but you don't know where to start. My recommendation is to start with prayer and stay praying. Don't just start there. It is a continual process. Talk to the Father about your time. What are you giving time, time to that you need to give up or cut back on? What do you need to add in? What do you need to say no to or say yes to? And what is the focus of your life? your hours, your day. Next, I would encourage you to make a plan. A lot of times, um, writing something out 
helps us to think through things more clearly, and makes us more likely to do it if we see it on paper. Um, look at your calendar. Look at your um, week schedule. Um, talk with a friend or your husband uh, to help keep you accountable, as well as their own input. These people see our lives. Chris knows very well where I waste my time or where I'm not using my time wisely. Um, that's why when I told him I was teaching on this, he laughed because he sees my life. Um, but we need that accountability in our life. They see those things, and we just have to do it. Um, I uh, Every year, I call it our planning retreat. I, Chris and I, like, come up to church. We get a whiteboard. We get our calendars out, and we, like, plan things of, like, goals we want to do and uh, for the year and things we want to work on or ways, like, the budget, the, like, all of the things. And it's awesome. I love that kind of stuff. Um, but we have to have a plan. We have to look at our calendar. If I say, hey, I really want to grow in my prayer life this year, Saying that is great. I have to have a plan of how I'm going to hopefully accomplish this or um, be more faithful in the Lord. So we need to pray. We need to make a plan. We need that accountability. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Find an older in the faith godly woman and meet for coffee. Talk about your struggles. Learn from her wisdom. Learn from the example of her life. Um, that is what the church is for. It's for the building up and the encouraging and bearing one another together. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Our goal in life should be to glorify God. And we cannot waste what has been given to us. And one of the most valuable things that God has given us is time. We have to steward it well for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord, we are before you, and we are humbled by our own inability, Lord. And so I ask that you would enable all of us to obey. Lord, you have provided what you have commanded of us. And so, Lord, we need your power to uh, steward well the gifts that you have been given and wisdom for how and discernment for how to steward um, those things. Lord, I pray that you would... Um, Take these words um, that you have given us in your word and um, that we would meditate on them, that we would chew on them, that they would become fruitful in our own lives. Lord, I pray now as we go to service, Lord, that you would um, incline our heart to your testimony, that you would open our eyes so that we could see wondrous things. Lord, I pray that you would unite our hearts to fear your name. And Lord, I pray that you would satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.